Hi everybody, this is Richard with BlueSheepDog.com and I have a presentation today on the recently released statistics from the FBI on the law enforcement officers killed and assaulted in 2010. Uh, this is a special presentation for the membership uh, section of BlueSheepDog.com, the Blue Crew, and I hope that this information will be useful to you. Just some baseline information on the number of assaults and deaths that we experienced in the law enforcement community in 2010. Uh, the total number of assaults was more than 53,000, uh, which is kind of an astounding number if you think about it. And of those, uh, some 26% resulted in officer injuries. So that's almost 14,000 officer injuries from assault last year alone. Um, our uh, total number of felonious deaths was 56, which is up over previous years. Um, compared to some years in the past, 56 kind of may seem like a small number to anybody that's been in law enforcement for a very long period of time, but still one is too many. If we think about how many assaults we actually experienced, almost 14,000 last year alone, um, in, in some ways it's kind of amazing to me that we don't have more deaths, and I don't know if that is because our officers are better trained, if we have better technology uh, as far as vests and, and things like that. We have better medical technology. Our paramedics and EMS staff is, is just better at saving lives. Um, or, or we just get lucky. I, you know, I don't know. Granted, of the 14,000, some of those injuries are probably minor. Um, something requiring a Band-Aid, perhaps. But... Uh, Quite a few of them are uh, life-changing. Now, if we look for the entire decade, 2001 to 2010, we had nearly 600,000 assaults on police officers. And over the decade, uh, almost 159,000, or a little over 27% of those, resulted in injury. So if we look just at the percentages, we actually did pretty good in 2010. Now... Uh, we had a total of 541 officers killed feloniously during the decade. I will point out that anytime you see uh, stats throughout this presentation on the decade, it does not include any of the deaths and injuries from the September 11, 2001 attacks. The FBI has elected to exclude those from their uh, officer assaults and officer death summaries. Um, cataloging that information separately just because of the incredible number of officers we lost on that one particular day. Uh, it kind of skews the results. And if we look at the results, then we may not, you know, with those numbers figured in, then those averages and things may not give us a clear picture of where we need to be as far as what kind of training we're doing in the field. So let's look at the types of weapons used to kill police officers. Well, in 2010, almost exclusively, we're talking about firearms. Uh, firearms are obviously um, something that can be used to kill a police officer. It does make the job a little easier um, if that is someone's intent. We do have one uh, officer that was killed by a vehicle uh, last year. If we kind of uh, look at the entire decade, uh, firearms still are the biggest number that is killing police officers. Of the 541 officers killed feloniously over the decade, almost 500 of those were due to firearms. But that doesn't mean that that is uh, the only thing that we have to worry about. The next biggest thing is vehicles. I think all of us have seen uh, police officers have been killed by suspects that are fleeing officers, that ram officers, that run over officers trying to deploy stop sticks, um, which if you follow the blog, bluesheepdog.com, I, I know you've seen me talk about stop stick deployment uh, two, three times this year because I believe this year alone we've had four officers killed trying to deploy some type of, of tire deflation devices and uh, have been killed by suspects. Now, when we're talking about firearms, and, and I think that we really need to talk about firearms because since that is the single most prevalent weapon used to kill police officers, I think that we need to spend quite a bit of time discussing um, 
how we train, what we do, uh, how we respond to subjects that, that present firearms. And one of the things that I know has been kind of a subject of debate for several decades, and that is how close is too close. Uh, at, at what distance are police officers in, in mortal danger, literally, from someone with a firearm? Well, if we look at just the distance from the offender and firearms deaths, um, and we're talking about felonious, not accidental, we can see that in 2010, uh, 21 of the officers killed were at five feet or less. So we're talking about contact distance just about. If not contact, certainly, uh, you know, uh, belly distance, if you will. That, uh, that makes up 38%, almost 40% of the officers killed were at a distance of 5 feet or less. Now we move that out to 10 feet, then we actually have moved up above 50%, and we're looking at a total of 28 officers that were killed at that point. As we move uh, a little farther back, 11 to 20 feet, we still have 10 officers that are being killed. At uh, 21 to 50 feet, six officers representing 11%, and more than 50 feet, we had four officers. Now, what's unfortunate is seven of the reporting agencies either didn't know or they failed to report, most likely, the information in the FBI. So we're talking about 13% of the data that we just don't really know what the distance was. And and 13% is actually a pretty big number. 13%, you know, if all of those officers were dying at, at you know, more than 50 feet, then that's going to skew the results pretty heavy one way. Likewise, if all of them were in the 0 to 5 feet range, then it's going to skew pretty heavy that way. If we look at the entire decade, that probably is going to give us a little better understanding. And we still see that 0 to 5 feet, that is the most deadly range. Um, over the decade, 49% of the officers we lost in gunfire, or gun, lost to gunfire, were five feet or less. We back up six to 10 feet, that's another 90 officers. So right there, we're looking at, what is that, close to 70% of the officers, 10 feet or less, which holds true to a lot of the, uh, a lot of the statistics that we've been looking at for the past 20 decade, or excuse me, 20 years, 30 years, um, that a lot of times we're losing officers real close. And we're going to look at kind of some of the circumstances in which police officers are killed. And I think those distances become a little more, um, a little more understandable. Now, one of the things that I know a lot of officers are concerned about are, is, is wearing body armor for uh, protection from, from firearms. And unfortunately, body armor does not guarantee that you're going to be safe from firearms. And what we're looking at here is in 2010, last year, we had 12 officers that were wearing body armor that received torso wounds where body armor would normally cover, but yet they still died. And why is that? Well, if we look, we can see that, for the most part, the ammunition is hitting where the armor is not. For example, below the vest, above the vest, uh, between the panels of the vest, or through the armhole. Now, sometimes we also have the vest that's penetrated due to rounds that are more powerful than what the vest is rated for. Might be, for example, you're wearing a uh, level 2A vest and you're shot with a high-speed 357 SIG. Okay, that, that's most likely going to penetrate the, the armor because the armor is not designed to stop that round. Whereas a level 3A vest definitely will. Most of the time, though, what we see when the vest is penetrated, we're talking about a rifle round. And when we're talking about soft body armor that we're going to wear concealed in uniform, they're not going to stop rifle rounds. Now, if we look for the entire decade, we can see that almost 100 officers were killed from torso wounds from a firearm while they were wearing body armor. 
And if we look down, we can kind of see where most of that lays and or lies. And, and what we're looking at again is 34 of the, of the 99. So we're talking about a little better than a third is going to be entry through the armhole or shoulder areas. And for anybody that has seen the tragic video of Trooper Mark Coates with South Carolina, uh, he got shot with a 22. And when he got shot, he was reaching up with his hand to key his shoulder mic to call for assistance. He got shot. And it's my understanding the 22 he was shot with hit just under his, under his bicep, hit in his arm. But when it hit, it kind of hit at an angle and then traveled up through the arm into uh, his chest and um, clipped an artery uh, or clipped his heart. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly, but, um, and then he, he bled out and died. And that's, that's going to be right there. He wound up with torso trauma, but the entry was made through that armhole shoulder area. So that's the reason why a lot of officers, uh, myself included, will move their mic to the uh, center of their chest rather than up on those lapels. And the, the idea being that it's a little easier to reach with both arms because it's more center line. Plus, when you're reaching to grab it, you're not pulling that arm up there and you're not exposing that open area into your torso. With your arm down, you're less likely to get shot there. If you do get shot there, the bullet's going to have to travel through the arm before it can make, uh, make its way to the, uh, to the torso. So, you know, is it safer? I think so. That's the reason why I do it. Um, but there's, there's no guarantees. But we also look at, at some of the other things for the decade, and we can see that vest penetration, um, there's 20 instances of that uh, where the, the round was just more powerful than what the vest was rated for. And we're going to look at vest penetration on, on a separate slide in a second. One of the other things I want to point out here, though, is that we have entry between the side panels of the vest at 12 and entry below the vest. Between the two, we're talking about 29 officer deaths. Some of that may be attributable or preventable um, with properly fitting body armor. Now if um, for all of you that read the newsletter you'll know in November I wrote an article about body armor and some studies uh, well basically a 2007 study done by the National Institute of Justice where they looked at body armor usage at the department level, not at the individual officer level, but at the department level. And there was a high number of departments that weren't properly fitting their officers with body armor. Well, when we look at this, we can say, well, there's 29 officers killed during the decade where a round penetrated, excuse me, a round did not hit the vest. Um, it went either below the vest or between the side panels of the vest. And I wonder how many of those, if um, all of those have been properly fitted body armor, would we still see 29 deaths? Are any of those because maybe the body armor wasn't fitted properly, wasn't long enough, or it didn't wrap properly on the sides? Uh, you know, I don't know. There may be a way to go back and, and uh, research some of that, but uh, right here, right now, I, I just don't know. But if you are wearing um, body armor that's not properly fitted, uh, you're, you're putting yourself at risk a little bit. I would recommend uh, getting with uh, a company representative that maybe comes to your department to, to outfit y'all. Um, maybe get with them, make sure that you're fitted properly, or if there's someone that knows what they're doing at your department, have them uh, measure you and everything and make sure that everything is fitting properly. Now, there is... Um, one other thing I want to point out, and that is uh, there was one instance of body armor failure. The uh, vest was penetrated, and the body armor failed to, brew, uh, failed to perform to the levels that it was supposed to. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Okay, so what we're looking at here is what calibers of firearms were penetrating the vest because we were, we were looking at um, a bunch of vests that had been penetrated over the decade 
uh, we've got <coughs> excuse me four total for uh, 2010 and we're looking at uh, I believe it was 21 for the entire decade so in 2010 what we had is we had two departments that just failed to report what kind of rifle was used and then two where it was a 762 by 39 rifle uh, the 762 by 39 is a cartridge that cartridge is typically used in the AK-47 and the SKS um, so both of the, those are uh, kind of medium power uh, they're not high power you know I hate it when I see the uh, see on the news uh, you know a sheriff or somebody else that didn't know what the heck they're talking about talk about those rounds being high power they're not high power high power would be like a 300 wind mag um, but anyway it's a medium caliber rifle and uh, medium power using a 30 caliber bullet okay pretty standard um, but anyhow it will penetrate soft body armor just like any other rifle round will so we had two rounds from that two rounds unknown now if we look at the entire decade we see that um, there was one instance of a handgun a nine millimeter uh, failing uh, or it, it went through a vest the vest failed to stop it and that particular case was in Panama City Florida a sergeant with the Panama City Beach Police Department made a traffic stop during the course of that traffic stop he goes to arrest the subject I believe he was driving without a uh, license or a suspended license or something I believe the subject was also wanted for some type of probation violation I'm not sure that the sergeant knew it regardless the subject produced nine millimeter fired three shots two of which struck the vest and both of which penetrated the vest into the sergeant's torso killing him um, the medical examiner cited that the uh, bullets penetrated the vest at a weak spot in the vest now I'm not sure what a weak spot in the vest means I don't know if the vest was made out of xylon which was shown to be um, an inferior product for stopping bullets over a period of time and uh, if, if the vest was made out of Xylon which definitely would have been in a period of time in, in 2005 where uh, that product would have still been on the market you know it's possible that you know the bullets penetrated because of, of the ballistic fabric it could be that the bullets hit at the very edge of the vest um, and so instead of being caught by the vest they just kind of glanced off the vest I'm not sure and I don't have the medical examiner's report to look at to, to give you a definitive answer regardless uh, that is only one of a very 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 few instances I've ever been able to find where a vest failed to perform now I can show you thousands of instances where a vest performed exactly as it was designed to um, and additional instances where the vest went above and beyond uh, during the decade we can see that of the 20 vests that were penetrated with rifle rounds uh, four of them came from the 223556 uh, which we're talking about an AR-15 typically many 14 that type of thing um, another five from the 762 by 39 the uh, 3030 uh, which is typically a lever action gun used for uh, uh, by a lot of folks on the East Coast of the United States for deer hunting and whatnot it's a pretty good cartridge out to uh, about 150 200 yards depending on your ammo and a lot of folks use it for whitetail and whatnot but anyway we see that uh, we've got three uh, officers killed uh, vest penetration with the 3030 cartridge if I, I kind of took all of the other uh, cartridges that were um, kind of typical hunting uh, cartridges I'm talking about 30 out 6 308 and uh, some others and those kind of totaled up to be six officers killed and then we had two that were not reported one thing that I will say is that the FBI and I find this unfortunately typical with a lot of law enforcement agencies um, they don't do a real good job on describing calibers um, for example they may say uh, 30 caliber uh, 308 300 
and you're not really sure on exactly which caliber that is, which which cartridge are we talking about? The 308, the 300, um, they're both 30 caliber, you know, and they're like the 30 caliber, really. I mean, they're all 30 caliber. <clears throat> the um, uh, question of a 30 carbine versus a 300 Win Mag, uh, huge difference, but they're both 30 caliber cartridges. So I think that, that we unfortunately are not getting a complete story on some of these things sometimes. It may be splitting hairs because whether we're talking about a 7mm08 or a 7 Win Mag, um, uh, or I mean, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> not a Win Mag, I'm thinking a 300 Win Mag, but anyway, it doesn't matter, they're all going to go through the vest, right? Um, but I think that just for uh, statistic purposes, we could do a little better job on describing what we're talking about. Now, if we look at the uh, states and where most of the assaults are taking place, we can see that of the almost, uh, well, a little more than 53,000 assaults that have taken place in the United States, California leads with the most number. However, when we actually um, take the number of assaults and uh, divide it by the number of officers that are um, uh, part of the responding agencies, we can figure that on average about 10% of the officers in the United States are assaulted every year. But that average we're talking about the entire United States. So if we, if we go and we look at the states with the most number of assaults, we can see the percentage varies widely. California is pretty close to the, uh, to the average for the nation. They had 7,200, 7, almost 7,300 assaults, which is a lot, but based on the number of, of police officers we're talking about, that only worked out to be 10.7% or just a little above the average. Florida, where I work, we had almost 6,500 assaults, but we are <clears throat> significantly above the average at 15.2%. Texas, also with uh, a lot of assaults at 43.56, but they came well under the average of 8.5%. So, you know, I don't know what that means. You know, are the folks in Texas friendlier to law enforcement than they are in Florida? Heck, I don't know, but... There may be some uh, there may be some important information there that we can we can pull out of that. If we look at Maryland, Maryland had less than half of the total number of assaults that California did, but yet those number of assaults represented 26.2 percent of the officers. So it would seem, at least just looking at that number, that Maryland would be a much more dangerous place to work than Texas, Florida, or California. Um, you know, we can kind of skip on down there. Uh, New Jersey uh, had of the top eight or the top seven here uh, that all had more than 2,000 assaults on officers. Uh, New Jersey actually had the lowest percentage of only 8%. Interestingly, if we look at the District of Columbia, now this does not include the federal law enforcement agencies. We're just talking about DCPD. But they had almost a thousand assaults, which represented uh, more than a quarter of their entire police department. And if we think about how many of those officers in their department are not working the street, they don't they don't leave the office. You know, they're sitting in an office somewhere, they're they're working property, or or uh, they're up in administration or whatever. You know, and and we take those guys out of it, that gives us what closer to thirty percent of the officers working the street were, you know, assaulted last year. Now, if we leave the detectives in it, you know, we're talking about, what, somewhere between 25 to 30 percent. If we take the detectives out and we're just talking about uniform patrol, what's that number? Is that closer to 50 percent? I don't know. Um, but certainly D.C. sounds like a uh, rough area to work just on that, on that stat alone. Now, if we look at the types of calls that officers are on, uh, this probably is not that big of a surprise to anyone. The vast majority of assaults, uh, in fact, uh, fully one-third of them, 
occur when officers respond to disturbances. That could be a domestic, that could be a bar fight, it could be a fight in the lobby somewhere, or a high school fight or something like that. But if, if, if you figure that a disturbance, generally there's folks fighting, certainly there's folks arguing, and, you, and the police show up, your presence doesn't make it get calmer. Oftentimes, now you're just another combatant. So it shouldn't be any any big surprise that of those um, or out of all the types of circumstances that that's that's the big one right there. But if we go down, we start looking at some of the others. We can see that attempting arrest in circumstances not already identified somewhere else. So we're not talking about trying to arrest somebody a disturbance. We're not trying to uh, arrest somebody a suspicious person, traffic stop, or any of those other categories but just it's not listed you're going to arrest somebody and we wind up with nearly 7900 assaults or close to 15 percent think about that for a second so in a lot of the other circumstances we're probably arresting people so attempting arrest not identified 15 percent so do you think that maybe 15 percent of all the other things that you're doing that's where the assaults are occurring maybe now, if we uh, start going a little farther down, you know, we've got the all other, which is 7,800. We can look at uh, handling or transporting prisoners. You know, let's face it, these guys, they want to break out. They, it's a lot of them figure they got nothing to lose. So that's going to make up a significant percentage. Suspicious persons and circumstances, uh, we're looking at 5,000. Traffic stops, 4,500. Um, and then things start to drop off pretty quickly. We're talking about someone with mental illness and EDP. We're talking about only a thousand. A burglary in progress, uh, 900. Civil disorder, almost 800. Robbery in progress, 450. And ambush, 248. Okay, so if you just look at this, you can go, wow, those disturbances, those are, those are the most dangerous things, attempting arrests and, and handling prisoners and that type of thing. Those are the most dangerous things. And I'm certainly not about to tell you that they are not dangerous. Uh, but I want to look at something else here in just a minute and kind of put some of that in perspective. Now, if we look at the types of weapons used during assaults. Now, these, these aren't the officers that are killed, although some unfortunately are. But we're just talking about assaults. The vast majority of the assaults take place with what? The hands, the feet, the kicks, the punches, the pokes, the push, the shove, whatever. Okay, that makes up almost 82% of it. Now, some other dangerous weapon makes up 13%. Now, some other dangerous weapon could be a hammer, a baseball bat, a golf club, um, a chalupa, a taco, a drink cup, uh, a coffee mug. You know, it could be any number of things, right? A bowling ball, all of those, all of those bizarre things that we've had people throw at us or attack us with. Firearms make up 3.4 percent, and then edge weapons make up 1.7 percent. Edge weapons are not just knives. Um, the edge weapons also can include things such as syringes, shank shivs, um, glass, any of those types of things. Could be a hatchet. So. Uh, as as a guy that absolutely hates being cut, uh, I'm glad to see that's the lowest one on there. Now, if we combine kind of the two prior slides together, we can look at what kinds of weapons are being used on what types of calls. And you can kind of peruse that, you know, you're listening to this, you can hit pause and, and kind of take a look at all that. <sighs> Firearms are used um, about 590 times, the biggest number, on disturbances. Um, which, if you think, hey, disturbances are by far and large the most number of assaults that we encounter, I guess that makes sense. Um, same thing with edged weapons, personal weapons. Um, the other weapons, though, is not necessarily uh, as huge a gap as uh, compared to some of the other categories. It's still the biggest, but if you drop down and look at traffic stops and pursuits, 
we can see that other weapons there is really close. And in fact, I would say it's statistically insignificant, the difference between the two. Traffic stops, what are we probably seeing a lot more used for weapons there? I'm guessing that's going to be vehicles. How many officers are being hit by vehicles, being rammed by vehicles? And we're talking about assaults. We're not talking about officers that were accidentally struck by a passing motorist. So I think that's something we need to really pay attention to uh, when we're doing traffic stops and, of course, when we're in pursuits. Nearly 1,600 other weapons. Not all of them are vehicles, but I bet you a lot of them are. One of the other things that we need to look at is the robbery and the ambush. Now remember, robbery and ambush, all of these, all of these circumstances are listed. They're in descending order from most number of assaults to least number of assaults. So the robbery in progress and the ambush are both the two lowest number of instances in which an assault occurs. Probably because they're two of the least likely things that we encounter, right? We probably go to a lot of disturbances every weekend, but very few robberies, right? Certainly in comparison. Probably go to, what, two, three, four bar fights and half a dozen domestics for every armed robbery you go to, maybe? Maybe more, maybe less? <clears throat> but if you look, there's a lot of firearms being used in both of those circumstances. In fact, robberies in progress represent a relatively small number of the calls that were responded to in which officers were assaulted. However, they made up nearly 23, 22.4% um, of the assailants used a firearm. And the same thing with ambushes. Very, very few number of assaults on police officers through ambushes compared to the whole, yet more than a fifth of the time, 21.4% of the assaults involve the use of a firearm. So does that suggest that robberies in progress and ambushes are inherently more dangerous? Well, maybe. Let's compare the, the weapons used, um, the types of calls, um, and, and the uh, number of officers that were killed and assaulted. If we look, you can see the number of assaults right here in descending order. But if we look down here, the number of officers killed, down here we see some pretty big numbers. The number one killer in 2010 of police officers, the circumstance, was ambush. Now we only recorded 248 assaults, yet we wound up right here with 15 deaths, which represents a little over 6% of all the assaults on police officers during an ambush resulted in a police officer's death. That is a huge number, especially when we compare it right up here. We had six officers killed during disturbances, which represents almost, you know, it's such a small number percentage-wise, 0.03%. And in the families of those six officers, obviously that number is too big. But when we compare it down here, the same number of officers being killed during a robbery in progress. We had 17,646 assaults during disturbances, 450 during robberies, same number of officers killed. That's better than 1% of the officers responding to a robbery in progress who were assaulted who wound up dead. Ambush, a little over, a little over 6% of the officers assaulted during an ambush wind up dead. And think about the purpose of an ambush. The purpose of the ambush is to assault an officer. So I would imagine that the vast majority of ambushes that occur wind up being reported as assaults and we wind up with nearly 6% of the officers in those being killed. That's a huge deal and that's something that we really need to look at going forward. How are we training? Are we training officers um, counter ambush tactics? And I'm not necessarily talking about what the Army or the Marines may train uh, their soldiers and Marines, but maybe some of those same 
ideas, some of the same tactics should apply. Because I don't know that we're teaching officers um, in our firearms training, our defensive tactics training, our officer, officer survival training, if we're teaching them counter ambush tactics. I mean, yeah, we're, ta we're teaching them, okay, you got a robbery in progress, you respond, you set up your perimeter, you uh, lock the facility down, what, whatever, okay, we, we get all that. But we lost 15 police officers in 2010 alone to ambushes. So we need to really look at how are we training our officers to counter that. And that's going to be something we're going to talk about in an upcoming training video. Well, I hope that you've gotten at least something out of this. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I went over all this information. The information is a year old, okay, and that's that's the nature of um, the, the statistics is we are always looking behind with statistics to see where we've been because there's no way for us to look into the future to see what's coming. If we knew what was coming, we just would prepare for it properly and no police officers would get killed. So we're having to look behind to see what happened before. And from that, try to figure out what we're going to do going forward. And if we're going to talk about what we should be training and how we should be training officers, then I think it's really important to look at these kinds of statistics, look at what is um, the most common areas where officers are being assaulted and killed, and start training around those. We can't rely on the statistics to to paint the whole picture of everything. But I think it's important to at least start with that to give us a baseline. Okay, for more information, obviously, you can go to the FBI's website. I've got the uh, their address listed there. Unfortunately, it's not just a simple FBI.gov slash L-E-O-K-A um, would take you there, but they for whatever reason, they've got all sorts of little subdirectors you got to go through to get there. Regardless, there that is. If you've got any questions for me, shoot me an email. Uh, you know, I'm available to everybody. Richard at bluesheepdog.com. As uh, a few of you recently have realized, I am very busy. I do respond to everybody. Um, it, it may take me, you know, a day, a couple of days to get back to you. If you send me an email and I don't respond back to you in a few days or something like that, feel free to shoot me another email. I literally get hundreds of emails every day and in there I try to I try to look at all of them but it is possible that one may now and again get deleted accidentally or may wind up in my spam box or something like that. So if you don't hear back from me your emails really are important to me. Shoot me another email and let me know. Again, this is Richard with the bluesheepdog.com and stay safe.